I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about ubiquitin and ubiquitin-like proteins, and mainly today's talk's about sumo. So uh, it's a little bit of a personal journey. So this is uh, my first slide. This is, um, I started my group in Glasgow uh, some time ago, and uh, my wife and I like walking, so we went up the Kilpatrick Hills, and you can see this tree that's, uh, that's just growing, and it's not a windy day, mind you, and um, the, the wind's been blowing this side so much that it stops growing on this side, and decided to edges bets on this way. So it kind of captured my imagination in terms of trying to understand how architecture of plants and growth of plants particularly affected by stress and what are the components that may be involved. And particularly, um, I'm interested in post transfer modifications or how we can uh, get a handle on post transfer modifications that allows plants to respond to stress quickly and then revert back to homeostasis if, you, if the stress goes away. So that's kind of where we started. But of course, this is a tree and doing a PhD or working on a tree is really hard, takes a long time, we don't get much funding for it. But it has a really an agronomic importance. And this is a computer tomography picture of a wheat, or, or sorry, a maize root going through the soil. And this is done in collaboration with Malcolm Bennett, Nottingham University, and Craig Sturrock. And you can see when you, when you try to make a dry side of the soil, the lateral roots only go in one direction, not the other, similar to what you see in the tree. And we, the modification I'm going to talk to you about today has got a quite important role in this process. And I'm not going to talk to you, talk to you about that process today, but it, we've, we've established that play, play, plays a key role in uh, auxin signaling in this pathway. So what we decided to do is to try and use Arabidopsis, okay, and a, a tractable system that we can use, and we can regulate growth by increasing the amount of salt on an agar plate. It's kind of artificial, but gives us a handle on how to get into it, and then move it on the crops we have to. So you can see if you increase the amount of salt, you reduce the growth. And this gives you a really neat system that you can control the amount of growth by controlling the amount of salt. And then we, what we started to do is to look, use a series of activation taglines and screen for mutants that grow in salt where normally the wild type doesn't. And the one here, you can see, we call this one HSD1 which is highly salt tolerant one, which is very imaginatively named. And it can grow, germinate and grow on, on, on plates where wild type doesn't. And this is an activation tagline. Well, so it's, it's got an enhancer element inserted and uh, a 35S promoter enhancer element, not a 35S promoter. So what it does is that this activation tagline expresses the gene more than it would within the context of the expression, so it's not ectopic. And when we did a tail PCR, we figured out that this uh, enhancer is in front of this gene called sumo protease like one. And this is where we got interested in sumulation. Sumo stands for small ubiquitin like modifier. And this class of sumo proteases is about, about uh, eight of them, nine of them right now. And they're very poorly annotated in, in genomes across, even in Arabidopsis. So, what, what is sumo? Sumo is similar to ubiquitin. Okay, so I've given you kind of pathways uh, that ubiquitin works on. Ubiquitin has an, uh, it's a process of uh, attaching a sub, uh, ubiquitin to small polypeptide that you attach on the lysine residues on target proteins. Okay, normally ubiquitin is made in tandem copies, and you have a ubiquitin-specific protease that cleaves it, releases it, and then you have a series of enzymes called E1, E2, and E3, which allows targets to come close to charge ubiquitin and then attach ubiquitin, or in this case, sumo, onto lysine residues. Sumo is similar to ubiquitin. It has the same class of E1, E2, and E3. And sumo proteases cleave sumo off the target protein. And they also process sumo from prosumo into active sumo. Okay? In the, in the Arabidopsis genomes, and generally across plant genomes, when it comes to ubiquitin E3 ligases, the number of E3s are enormous. There's 10 times more E3s in plants than there are in humans, okay? So it's a bit like the roundabout in the UK. Sooner or later, if you're driving, you're gonna hit the roundabout. It's a bit like that, okay? But in the case for sumo, for example, you get attachment on the lysine residue, just like ubiquitin, but there's only two E3s. It's the expansion of the gene family on the, on the sumo system seems to be at the level of the protease. So they seem to regulate that. And OTS1 is one of those proteases. So there are two of them in Arabidopsis. And when you have no stress, no salt, 
you, this is a double mutant here. You don't see any kind of phenotype. When you put it on salt, you see a growth sensitivity. Here, growth retardation phenotype, and it's very nice and clear. Single mutants, are, you don't much see a phenotype uh, significantly compared to wild type. And when you make a double, it's very nice and clear. So to cut a long story short, what we found um, um, is that so when you overexpress the sumo protease, it allows plants to become a little bit more uh, resistant to salt stress. So in other words, they keep growing on salt. And not only that, at this point, there was no antibodies available to look at how sumo works in plants and what are the targets for sumo. And all the antibodies that was available at the market that they'd said there was sumo, including those from Rick Viestro, who did all those pull-downs that I really talked about, cross-react with ubiquitin. So we made our own antibody, sumo 1, sumo 2. So before I go into that, there are eight sumos in plants, and sumo 1 and 2 are the major players when it comes to stress. The other sumos do different things, but they're not particularly linked to stress in the way that we're gonna, I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so you can see this is a Western blot made with purified anti sumo 1 2 antibodies. And without stress, you don't see much sumolation. This is a gradient gel, and you can see this. Uh, this is a sumo uh, a protein, which is going up when you increase the number of amount of salt, millimolar. But when you, when you look at the, the whole gel, there's not much conjugation of sumo on the target protein. Normally, when sumo is attached on the target proteins, you see a shift up. And when you increase the amount of salt, you start seeing this smearing effect, which is the number of sumo conjugated proteins going up and up and up. And in the OTS mutant, double mutants, you can see even without stress, the sumo conjugation is up already. So, at, so essentially, when you overexpress the OTS sumo protease, you you remove this this uh, remove this simulation or desumulate the target proteins, and this allows plants to recover and grow on salt. But what Arabidopsis does is that as soon as it sees stress, it degrades the protein. It degrades the per sumo protease, accumulating sumo conjugated proteins, and that is blocking growth. This is kind of, this, this is what this model is showing. That's what we did. As a whole, we did a whole bunch of pull-down assays to kind of prove that and prove that it is a sumo protease, all of that stuff. But the model is, when stress comes, OTS sumo protease goes away, sumo conjugated target proteins accumulate, and they block growth. So I'm gonna to talk to you about one of the target proteins today uh, called DELA, and Irene is uh, kindly, uh, recognize that the 5B is simulated, and we published that last year. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I'm going to talk about this, because our way into understanding how sumo works in plants is to look at the sumo protease mutant, and what is the phenotype that mutant is exhibiting. And through that, we try to understand how sumo regulates stress signaling, and that's kind of my way of, of, of realizing how this work, thing works. So here, the stem length, and we can always see OTS1, OTS2 double mutants, where there's no sumo protease, they always dwarf. And you can recover the growth sensitivity when you put it on the paclobutrazol, which blocks GA biosynthesis, and OTS double mutants is a lot more sensitive, and you can recover by adding GA. So they're dwarf plants, and they're sensitive to paclobutrazol, which blocks GA biosynthesis. So the obvious target is, are DELA proteins simulated? And what are DELA proteins? So DELA proteins are a bunch of growth repressors. Okay, there are five in Arabidopsis, and they regulate how GA promotes growth. GA promotes growth, and DELA proteins repress growth. GA promotes the degradation of DELA proteins, and therefore to release growth. When you add paclobutrazole, you reduce the levels of GA, and you accumulate the level of DELA proteins, and that blocks growth. Okay, so GA13 and GA15, these plants, Arabidopsis plants, do not make GA or make very little GA, and they happen to be, they become dwarf. And when you put them under, when you cross them into a RGA, one of the DELA protein knockouts, the growth is restored. And you get more and more of that when you start uh, stacking up all the mutations. So we've shown, and the way the DELA proteins work is that GA, gibberellic acid, binds to GIT1, the GA receptor, and then the GA receptor has got a lid-like component that closes and traps the GA in there, and this allows the GA git one complex to bind to DELA proteins via the DELA motif. And the DELA motif and the git one GA acts as a co-chaperone to bring the DELA to an F-box complex called SLE1, 
U-box E3 ligase complex that ubiquitinates it and degrades it, and then you get growth. Okay, this is the kind of paradigm of Della degradation and growth promotion in plants. This is quite important because this is one of the bases behind the Green Revolution, where the RHT alleles, here, showing here, these are the mutants of wild type, mutants of the RHT alleles. RHT is the wheat Dellas. Okay, it's GAI in Arabidopsis. And these mutants are all more and more and more resistant to degradation via the ubiquitination pathway. And this gives you the dual phenotype, what you see in the OTS mutants. Okay, and the dual phenotype then gives rise, we still don't know how, to more yield in terms of seed production and seed weight. Okay? So when you cross the OTS mutants, which are very, double, very sensitive to salt, with the RGA, which is one of the Della proteins, RGA mutant, you can start to restore growth. So this shows that the OTS protease, sumo protease, is working through one of these Della, uh, Della dependent mechanism. And then we did a pull down, and we spent, actually we spent a long time trying to do these pull downs because it's really hard to see sumolated proteins because as soon as you lyse the cells, including plant cells, it's sumo is cleaved off target protein. So we pull down Della using a, a, a Della, with this, in this case, RGA Della, is tagged the GFP driven by its own promoter. We did a GFP pull down, so much protein that you can see in a comacy stain gel. And when you probe that with our specific sumo one antibodies, you start to see a sumo ladder. Okay, this is just part of the picture. Then we pull down the same sumolated proteins here, and then you mix them with the wild type OTS1 sumo protease to prove that this, this banding pattern we see here is actually sumolated uh, Della, which can be cleaved by a bona fide sumo protease. And, when you, uh, and then you get this product here. And when you, sorry, here, and you get more uh, GFP release, GFP, RGA. This is a non sumolated form, this is a sumolated form. When you incubate that with a wild type form of the enzyme, this, this banding pattern goes away. When you incubate that with the active site mutant, so sumo proteases are cysteine proteases, when you incubate that, when you make a cysteine to serine mutation, it can't cleave it. And we've also shown that the OTS1 sumo protease directly interacts with the Della proteins in vivo implanted by pull-down assays. And we also now, we, then we realized that um, that during salt, or when you add paclobutrazol in this case here, there are two species of Dallas in plants. One is the non sumulated form, and the other one is the uh, sumulated form. And they accumulate when you deliver more and more stress. So when you increase the amount of salt from here, sumulated Della goes up. This is the western blot. And then the non sumulated Della also goes up. So there's a relationship between sumulated Della and non sumulated Della. And paclobutrazol mimics kind of a stress. Because this time Nick Harvard who published a paper that shows that uh, most stresses, what they do in plants is that they lower GA levels, which is what paclobutrazol does, inhibits GA biosynthesis. That lowering of GA levels promotes Della accumulation and that blocks growth. And this fits this really, really well. Okay, so when you add more and more paclobutrazol, you accumulate sumulated Della and you accumulate non-sumulated Della. Okay, so they both accumulate together. Here's the problem I have, okay? So we can explain all our phenotype if you said that you're, all you're doing the OTS mutants is that you are having less, less GA. And less GA means more Della, okay? That explains everything. It doesn't. Because here's, here's the wild type OTS1, wild type Colo Landsberg cross, um, and this is the OTS mutant. You get lots more sumulated Della and lots more Della, okay? That fits. And here's the western blot, again, showing this on, uh, uh, this is the immunoprecipitation, this is western blot. In the wild type, there's less sumulated Della, there's less Della. Okay, all of that fits. But this slide here shows that there's no change in GA at all. So the GA levels are exactly the same, but then you're starting to accumulate Dellas. There's no change in the transcript, there's no change in the transcript of Dellas, any of the Dellas, there's no change in the transcript of any of the GA biosynthesis, or degradation enzymes, and the levels of GAs across the different GAs are exactly the same. Now we're stuck, right? We have to explain the mechanism of how you can accumulate Dallas without changes in GA, because Nick said he'll never let me publish if I don't explain that. So here we go. We needed to prove, we need to have another way to prove this. So this is a GA15 mutant that makes next to no GA, okay? 
And that is dwarf because you've got lots of delis, okay, here compared to wild type, right? When you always express the sumo protease, you're cleaving the sumo off the delis, and you can start the reverse dwarfism in plants, okay? And there's no change in the GA levels in these. So there is a GA bypass mechanism that operates through sumo, all right? But how do you prove it molecularly? You can show this by genetics, nice Western blots, and when every time you all express the sumo protease here, you lower the levels of DELA, and therefore it reverse dwarfism. But this is not dependent on GA because these plants don't make GA, okay? We tried to prove this in two ways. One, we figure out, the, one of the problems in, in plant simulation is that the sumo size that occur in plants look very, very different from the sumo size that occur in animals. There are programs in, in the web that you can download and predict sumo sites in plants. In our hands, they never worked. Okay, they always predict the off-target. Some of them are ubiquitin sites. Because, because the plant, uh, the animal sumo system is very different because it relies on E3 ligases. Well, the plant sumo system relies on the UBC9 or the E2 to do its job. That's what we found. So what we did was then to develop our own software that will allow us to specifically predict sumo sites in plants only, and we're not really interested in animal stuff. Okay, and we used that, and we used a whole bunch of targets to validate that program. And we, one of these is Della. So our program predicts that this lysine here, and this is the Della motif here, okay, and this is the lysine here. This lysine is conserved across all the five Dallas in Arabidopsis, the maize, the rice, the wheat, and the barley, all of these sites, okay? And we have a single cell system where we put all the E1, E2s together, and it can simulate Della, and this is the Western blot that shows. This is the normal RGA Della. Sumo is added on, you can see the shift up. You mutate the lysine to an arginine, so you still, you maintain the amine group, but change the epsilon amine group, the simulation doesn't occur. So you maintain the structure, but you just don't have the free epsilon amine group. So that's a really nice mutation to make, a nice allele to generate that works. And then when you always express this, what we're beginning to see is that plants behave as if they don't see stress. Okay, so this is a mild drought stress. This is a plant that's expressing GI, the crop type of Dallas. Okay, if you always express them, you get dwarf plants and the mild stress. But when you have a lysine to arginine mutation that is non-simulatable, they just grow even in mild stress, as if they don't see the stress. And we're testing this in extreme stress now. This is just control plant that shows that it under uh, non-stress conditions, okay? And what we found here is that they also behave the same way in salt, okay? The, the non-simulatable GI, they start to grow in salt, while the 35S ones are dwarf and, st and slow down growth. And the, this is the 35 SGI, this is the Western blot. This shows the wild type, and the simulatable, the non-simulatable Della it becomes completely unstable. So even though when we do a huge pull-down, pull down a huge amount of protein to see 5% of Della protein simulated at the steady state level, but when you mutate the sumo site, the entire pull is gone. So this shows in plants that you have a steady state, you have a constant simulation, desimulation goes on, that is somehow, uh, recruited during stress to stabilize Dallas and then uh, block growth. And this has to be GA independent, okay? That's, that's the issue, that's the problem. So we go back to this model. You have GA that binds to Git1, okay? This acts as a co-chaperone to bring Dallas, the interacts with Dallas. Dallas go to the E3 complex, ubiquitinated, degraded, you have growth. Therefore, if you want this to work, you need GA to bind to Git1, okay? What we did then did, is to model the structure of the Git1 GA receptor underneath here, and then the GAI Della protein at the top here. The two alpha helices, okay, here, that dock onto the Git1 protein, okay, the lysine that's simulated is right here, that's poking right into where the GA would dock into the Git1 protein, this yellow patch here. Never eat yellow snow. So this yellow patch here. So we, then it kind of told us that there must be something at the lick part where the GA docks that is responsible for this modification to stabilize Dallas. So we then wrote a separate computer program that will allow us to predict sim sites. So sim sites are sumo interacting motifs. They bind to proteins which are simulated. Okay? And the sim sites are hydrophobic patches which 
unusually stick outside of proteins. Okay? So we can successfully predict those at, at this stage. And lo and behold, similar to sim predictions in, in animal system, the plant one looks very, very different. Okay? So this program that, predict, that allows us to predict sumocytes also allows us to predict sim sites. Okay? So this is sumo sim interaction. And then what we did was to then uh, uh, make this peptide that mimics the sim sites here that we identified, do a far western that sumo then, you put a, a peptide on the membrane, you blow, uh, float sumo on the top, it binds, and then it lights up. And you can see the Git1 has sim, uh, in the Git1, the GA receptors in crops as well as arabidopsis have a sim. Okay? And this sim interacting with the Git1, uh, sumo, in the Git1 in, uh, the sim in Git1 interacting with sumo is GA independent. So now we have a mechanism where there you can have a hormone bypass, a GA independent mechanism through sumo. Okay? Here's just a GST protein assay that shows you, you know, whether you have GA or not, the sumo will interact with Git1. And we can mimic this in vivo in plants. So we do the pull down assays. This is sumo later Della. Okay, whether you have GA or not, it will come down with uh, Git1. But only RGA, which is non simulator form, comes down with Git1 when you have GA. And what does it do? How does this work mechanistically? So this is a SPR surface plasma resonance work, okay? So where you have RGA, so you put Git1 on a chip and you float RGA on the top and you add GA and you get this really nice binding curve, okay? But when you add sumo to this, this binding drops. So we know that it's simulated Della, binds the Git1, whether there's GA or not, and blocks Git1 accessing non simulated Della. All right? And then you got no co chaperone action to degrade Dellas. Right? If that is true, then the rate limiting factor in this whole pathway is Git1, the GA receptor. And if we over express the GA receptor, it should overcome the OTS phenotype. And that's exactly what we find. So you over express so transgenic plants, over express. In the OTS1, you get slowdown and growth in salt. When you overexpress Git1, it overcomes it. Let's go one step further. This model predicts the simulated Della, GA binds to Git1, and then Della binds the um, uh, GA Git1 complex, go to degradation. And what simulated Della does is that it binds to the Git1 uh, lid part and blocks this Git1 to bind to non simulated Della. That means we can go one step further and make a new allele of the GA receptor where we remove the sim site. And this is the sim, no, sim mutant of Git1 here. And that is better in growing than the, than the Git1 alone. So we've generated two novel types of alleles for, uh, in Arabidopsis um, in the GA pathway. The Git1 sim mutant that can overcome stress. Remember, this pathway only operates when you have stress. So you don't, have, you don't necessarily have yield penalty, all right? Because simulation only occurs when there's stress. Okay, so we have a non simulatable Della and we have a sim mutant in Git1 that works through this way. And it only works during stress. So this is my original slide that I drew to work this pathway. So basically, simulated Della blocks uh, Git1 interaction Della and this then uh, stabilizes Della and you block plant growth. And I think, I'm gonna thank all the people here. Uh, Stuart and uh, Lucio did all the work when he was in my lab. Now he's, he's, he's got his own group in uh, Milan. And Malcolm Bennett for the RGA antibodies, Peter Hedden for GA measurement, and uh, Richard Napier for helping me with the SPR work that we've been doing with him, and Nick Harvard for giving me the RGA GFP constructs. And these are all the people who gave me money. Thank you very much. <laughs>